Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory do His name. Worship the Lord in splendor of His holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the yokes and strips the forest bare. And in His temple all cry, Glory. So, let's come to the Lord, shall we? Welcome this morning. Our call to worship is Psalm 53. This is the Maskil of David. The fool says in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone is turned away. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will the evildoers never learn? Those who devour my people as men eat bread and who do not call on God? There they were, overwhelmed with dread, where there was nothing to dread. God scattered the bones of those who attacked you. You put them to shame, for God despised them. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when God restores the fortunes of His people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Let's sing hymn number 64. Our scripture reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19 as we set a context for what happens in Daniel chapter 6. Deuteronomy 19 beginning verse 16 to the end of the chapter. This is really an exposition on the commandment against murder. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse a man of a crime, the two men involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who were in office at that time. The judges must make a thorough investigation, and if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against his brother, then do to him as he intended to do to his brother. You must purge the evil from among you. The rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid, and never again will such an evil thing be done among you. Show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. Bo, can you come lead us in prayer? Let's come and pray. We praise You, Heavenly Father. We praise Your holy name. We know that You are great and You are above all gods. And whatever pleases, You do. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deep places. You cause the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. You make lightning for the rain bring wind out of your treasuries. You destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. You set signs and wonders into Egypt in the midst of you, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. You defeated many nations and slew mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. You gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, your people. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your fame, O Lord, throughout all generations. For you will judge your people and you will have compassion on your servants. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and uh, we lift up our uh, praises and prayer requests to you. We give you praise for the annual recital and all the children that, that did well and ask that you would continue to bless them and encourage them. Heavenly Father, we we'll give you thanks and praise for, for rivers to float on and for lazy days in the sun. We give you thanks and praise for all of that. Well, you should know by now that Daniel 6 matches which of the Ten Commandments? The fourth. No, not the fourth. <laughs> the story of Daniel in the lion's den revolves around an attempted murder. And the Sixth Commandment says, You shall not commit murder. And we've seen through Bro's preaching in the Sermon on the Mount that murder is, of course, much more than just committing a violent act. 
And of course, the commandment applies to that as well. But we see in Daniel chapter 6 an attempted murder. And as I said as we did our scripture reading, the context here is really set in the law back in Deuteronomy 19. Malicious witnesses, those who attempt to use the law court system as a tool to harm someone, malicious witnesses were to be given the same punishment that they intended for their victim. And this is really a principle in the law of Moses. And I think that if our law system actually followed this principle, you'd have a weeding out of frivolous lawsuits very, very quickly. If those who brought lawsuits, frivolous lawsuits, received the same punishment that they were seeking against someone else, you would have an end to frivolous lawsuits like what we see here in Daniel chapter 6. But malicious witnesses were actually trying to use the law court system to do harm against their enemies. And so they would make up a story, they would make up a false report, and they would make these witnesses to bring them to the court, and then the court would actually have to decide whether those witnesses were legitimate or not. And then, of course, the, the innocent was to be set free, and the guilty was to be punished with a, with a punishment that was due to the law. Now, as we've worked through Daniel, I've emphasized how the story progressively builds on the details and imagery throughout the book. And we're going to see how that works more so in Daniel chapter 6 in a more subtle way. And we're going to see how this develops a little bit more. And there is a big new development in Daniel chapter 6 with Persia. Now remember, Daniel 5 was at the end of the reign of Babylon in God's kingdom. And the kingdom was given over to Darius the Mede, who united Media and Persia together in one kingdom. He was also known as Cyrus the Persian. And this new empire had a different flavor to it. And we're going to see a transition in Daniel chapter 6 from individual rulers who represent a threat to God's faithful people. Remember Nebuchadnezzar before his conversion? He became a threat to Daniel and Daniel's three friends with a fiery furnace. And now we're going to have a transition to tyrannical and unjust laws that threaten God's people. And so there is a progression here in the story. Daniel and his three friends did not obey Nebuchadnezzar the king when he served them food from his table in Daniel chapter 1. Nor did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bow down and worship the image of gold at Nebuchadnezzar's command in Daniel chapter 3. It was an individual king that was a threat to them. But now we have, um, and we saw how they were, uh, give us a good example about how to respond to ungodly rulers. And now in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel shows us how the godly should respond to evil laws. And as we'll see, Daniel ignores the wicked law and experiences God's personal protection in the lion's den. And the text tells us precisely why God protected Daniel in verse 23 of chapter 6. No wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And so the lesson is very clear from Daniel chapter 6. Radical protection comes to those who lead holy lives and place radical trust in God. And that's really the lesson of Daniel chapter 6. Now there is more to the account of Daniel and the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6 beyond just this story because I believe that this story is telling a bigger story in a very interesting artistic way. But to get to that point, we have to first look at the details of the story in Daniel chapter 6. So let's begin reading in verse 1 of Daniel 6. Remember, this is after Babylon had been conquered by Darius the Mede. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And so Daniel has this habit We've seen Daniel in this story from the very young man taken to Babylon. He finds a place of prominence. His place of prominence continues in this new administration of the kingdom under Darius. 
and we see that Daniel's excellent abilities and reliability get noticed by Darius just as they had been noticed by Nebuchadnezzar when Daniel was a young man. And of course, we should recognize right now that Daniel is very old right now. He's probably 20 to 30 years older than Darius is. So he's, a, he's an aged man. And just as the other officials grew jealous of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, in Daniel chapter 3, leading to the story of the fiery furnace, remember, the Chaldean wise men went to Nebuchadnezzar and said that there are these Hebrews who do not bow down and worship you. Their jealousy led them to rat out, so to speak, the Hebrews who do not bow down and worship the image of gold. So we have another story of jealousy, and this jealousy is from the other administrators against Daniel. And they realized that the only way they could bring Daniel down would be related to the law of his God. So let's continue in verse 6. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days except you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Is that a true statement? Had they all agreed? Remember, Daniel is one of the governors here, and yet he was not consulted. No, this is a false testimony that these governors brought before Darius. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed, so King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, this may have been a very difficult time of transition. If you go back and you read some history, some ancient history about the the transition between Babylon and Medo-Persia, it was actually a fairly peaceful transition from kingdom to kingdom. But it took a while for... Actually, I should back up a little bit. Cyrus or Darius depending on how he's being referred to as a Mede or a Persian, had moved the kingdom from Babylon, the center of his kingdom, Mede Persia, from Babylon to another city. And so this left the people of Babylon without any gods, essentially. Without any type of temples, they had been all removed. And so this becomes a very difficult period of transition in which the people did not have their established ways of idolatry to give them peace. And so what they do is they offer here a way of presenting stability in the kingdom. For 30 days during this transition, this is fairly fairly close to after when Medo-Persia just sacked Babylon and took over the kingdom. For 30 days, they would outlaw any other prayers to any god or man other than Darius the king. And they presented this idea here to establish Darius' rule over, over this new phase of God's kingdom the silver portion of the metal man image and so that's why you have a a time period a 30 day time period this is only a temporary thing because they understood they would have to place back into use the gods and the idols etc that were common in this culture and that would of course lead to more stability down the road but this was really designed for this transition period but that's all that they needed Those governors who were jealous of Daniel, that's all they needed because they knew that Daniel had a particular habit of worshiping God three times a day. And so they knew that 30 days would be enough to catch Daniel. And we should recognize in this story as well that they attempted to use the law to bring about the death of Daniel and by doing that would remove him as a rival to them. That's the jealousy part. But really what these leaders were doing was an attack on Darius because Darius had picked Daniel. And if Darius were to lose Daniel, he would be in a weaker position to govern over the kingdom because he needed the help of Daniel. So really what this is going on is not just an attack on Daniel. This is actually an attack on Darius and actually a sedition against his kingly rule. And that comes into play because of what Darius does at the end. Now, Darius was, of course, lied to about the whole matter. They said that all the officials had agreed to this, but clearly Daniel was never consulted. And so we see a contrast right from the beginning between Daniel and his ability and Darius' ability. Because remember, the very, one of the very first things that was mentioned about Daniel is that he was trustworthy in all that he did, neither corrupt nor negligent. But Darius 
by passing this law, by making this edict, without consulting all of his wise men, had become negligent as well. And so we see a contrast here right off the bat between Daniel and Darius. Darius was at best negligent for not checking up on the statement, and he was at worst corrupt for agreeing to a law such as this. So Darius issues the sinful edict, and this sinful act of Darius made it so that it would appear that Daniel would have to pay for Darius' sin, for Darius' crime of this law. Daniel would be the one who would have to pay with his life. Verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or man except you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego showed us what to do when confronted with evil rulers. They disobeyed the king's order to bow down and worship the gold of image. Now, Daniel ignores the wicked law that forbids the worship of God. Notice the two different directions that those commands have gone. In Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's position, they were commanded to commit idolatry. And now, in Daniel's case, the edict was that they could not worship God, they could only worship Darius. So there's, there's a parallel there between the, the book of Daniel. Also, we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being cast into the fiery furnace, and in this, the, pen, the penalty for this law was that Daniel would have to be cast into the den of lions. Now, I think it is significant to point out here that Daniel's three friends in Daniel 3, nor Daniel in Daniel chapter 6, try to overthrow the governments that were established, that threatened them. Now, did they actually get together with the other Jews and plan a revolution to overthrow this ungodly ruler, this ungodly law? No, they actually did something much more subversive than that outright act of revolution. What they did was they just simply did what they were supposed to do. They worshipped the God that they worshipped. And they allowed God to rule in the midst of that ungodly kingdom and to deal with that ungodly law on his own terms. That's exactly how they handled it. And it's a very subversive thing because it's not so much as puffing up your chest and picking up the sword using the same swords that they're being used. It's more subversive because they simply went on with their lives rendering to their Caesar what was Caesar's and to God what was God's. Because they knew that God would bring down the wicked governments in his own time either by conversion in the case of Nebuchadnezzar because remember Nebuchadnezzar converted to the one true faith or by destruction in the case of Belshazzar. And so their job, and I I would submit to you that they're really an example for us, that their job was to remain faithful to God and let God work His will through their faithful obedience in these kingdoms. And it may be a little different too because they understood that these kingdoms were established by God and God had a purpose for those kingdoms as well. So we may have a little bit more liberty in the New Covenant era than they had in this old creation status. But it's a very subversive thing to just continue doing what God has called you to do. Continue worshiping God. When ungodly laws come upon us, we just simply ignore them and do what we are called to do. When ungodly rulers command us to do things that are not allowed, we just simply ignore. And that's really the demonstration that Daniel and his three friends give us in this kingdom. Now Darius shows how fond his relationship with Daniel was by seeking Daniel's rescue the rest of the day. 
And by this time, he surely knew that he had been tricked by the other officials. And we see a glimpse here of Darius's heart because Darius is not only going to try to save Daniel, Darius if he is truly Cyrus, which I believe he is. I believe it's just a, a different name for the same guy. Cyrus was also the one who would give the decree for Israel to go back to the land of Israel, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. And so we see this heart of Cyrus, this heart of Darius here in his friendship with Daniel and he makes every effort until sundown to save him from the lion's den. And yet all of Darius' attempts to rescue Daniel are futile. Verse 15. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. This is a brazen demand placed upon the king by these leaders. They're forcing the king's hand based on the law that he had written. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. Darius has remarkable faith and remarkable hope in the God of Daniel. He believed that Daniel's God would rescue him from death and that really should not seem odd to us because it is inconceivable that Darius would not have known about the fiery furnace ordeal in the previous administration of Nebuchadnezzar and how God saved Daniel's three friends from the fire. And if God can save three men from a fiery furnace, he can certainly save Daniel from the lion's den. And so Darius ordered Daniel into the den of lions, which would have been a large pit. And then the king placed a stone over the pit and sealed it, making Daniel's tomb, as it were. And the stone placed over the mouth of the den should give you a little hint at what is going on here is a little bit prophetic of another story to come. But you have to really get a feel for Daniel's situation. It would have been pitch black in there. Remember, this is set sundown. And the stone would have covered the mouth of the, of the, of the pit, of the den. Also, it probably would have smelled really bad inside the pit. You guys probably you know what a cat litter box smells like. Imagine a den full of big lions. How bad that stunk. And there was probably bones in there from the other, other things that the, that the lions had been eating. Not a real nice place to be. We think of all these nice purry kitty cats. No, it wasn't like that. It was a disgusting, dark, stinky place to be. And there Daniel would sit and wait all night long in this terrible dungeon with huge lions all around him. And yet they never touched Daniel. Darius had to lay awake all night in his palace wondering about his friend below. And that's really the image here that we have in this chapter. It's sort of interesting to think about because Daniel began praying in the upper room where his window opened up to Jerusalem and then he is lowered into the pit with the lion's den. Verse 19. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den and when he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not heard me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Darius' actions over the night and his return to the den at dawn do not point to a man who was ignorant of God or did not believe in God. Darius has faith and hope that Daniel's God could and would save him from the lions and God rewarded Darius' faith. So it's not just Daniel here who's being saved and rewarded. 
it's also Darius who would have lost his best governor. And so Darius, a Gentile, has faith in God and he also is rewarded because Daniel was kept perfectly safe. And so Daniel is raised up out of the pit and the king is overjoyed to see him alive. And this is another example of these patterns that we see in the book of Daniel of God choosing to overrule in his kingdom. God chose Daniel and his three friends over those leading King Nebuchadnezzar's false worship by saving them from the fiery furnace. We saw how that happened. Remember, the king's strongmen got burned up and yet the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who go into the fiery furnace come out alive. God chose them as to be his priests, not Nebuchadnezzar's strongman. And now we have also this choosing going on here as well. Daniel is chosen to be chief official by God's overruling power against those who had set themselves against Daniel to destroy him. And notice what the king did to those who falsely accused Daniel of treason against Darius. And this is, of course, the penalty for attempted murder. Verse 24. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before, yet before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. So Darius fulfilled Deuteronomy 19 by giving these men the same punishment that they attempted to bring on Daniel through false witnessing. Attempted murder called for the death penalty and so they were destroyed with their entire families, which is an important detail, with their wives and their children as well, as we'll get to the wider context of the story here. And the punishment for these malicious witnesses against Daniel would be an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And the lions were ready by the time that their new meal arrived. And so these lions now have become God's lions, where the story begins out with these lions being the evil men's lions. Verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Now this proclamation should look familiar to you because it resembles Nebuchadnezzar's confession after his conversion to the true faith of Abraham. Darius found his place in God's kingdom by faith through the ministry of Daniel. And by the way, this is God's kingdom. It's very clear in verse in verse 26. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. So when we get to the New Testament and Jesus starts talking about the kingdom of God, realize that this is a story that's been going on for a long time because this is God's kingdom right here. But here we have Darius who finds his place in God's kingdom by faith through the ministry of Daniel and we see this great reversal in the chapter from the beginning where Darius had decreed that no man can seek or pray to any other god or man than him. At the very end, he issues this edict that all in his kingdom, far and near, must fear and reverence God, the true God of Daniel. And so the story of Daniel and the lion's den tells a bigger story. And I hope you can see by now that the account tells of a symbolic death, burial, and resurrection. That's really what happens in this chapter. Daniel goes through a death, burial, and resurrection to pay for the sin of another. So first we should see in this story, in the closer context, in the closer historical context to this time period, we should see in the story of Daniel, the story of Israel. Have you ever wondered why this ordeal involved lions? Why did it have to be a lion's den? Why lions? Why not just hang anyone who breaks the law? Why not just, um, why not bears? Why not run them through the, with a sword? Cut off their head? Why is it a lion's den? Well, it's no coincidence that lions play their role in the story 
and that it wasn't something like bears. Lions in the story because Daniel's story is first and foremost a story of Israel. So let's go to Daniel chapter 7 and we'll see why lions are specifically referenced. Daniel chapter 7, the next chapter, we're going to talk about this next time in more detail, but Daniel chapter 7 verse 4, this prophecy of Daniel matches Daniel 2 in the image of the metal man and so the order of the animals here match the order of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and clay. And the very first one is the first kingdom, this was the, the first kingdom, was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted up from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man and the heart of a man was given to it. Who's it talking about? Who received a new heart? The first kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar. So all of Nebuchadnezzar and the entire kingdom of Babylon is associated with lions in Daniel chapter 7. And so that really makes the connection back to the lions then. In fact, these are probably Nebuchadnezzar's lions. He, he was probably the one who actually got them in the first place because remember Darius um, took over the kingdom. So Babylon is associated with lions. And so when Daniel goes down into the lion's den and comes back out after the allotted time, he's actually telling the story of Israel who went down into Babylon, into the lion's den in Babylon, and we find out in Babylon that the lion's mouths are shut against Israel because God works these miracles in, in Daniel's life and in, in the three, his three friends' lives. And then after the allotted time has passed, the 70 years, Israel comes out of the lion's den and goes back to their land. Rebuilds the temple, rebuilds Jerusalem. And so Daniel is a story of Israel in their death, burial, and resurrection. Also, and I think that's one of the reasons why lions are specific and why it was no coincidence that these are lions. But when I say that the Daniel and the lions then is a miniature version of the history of Israel, you should consider how Daniel 6 is also prophetic of Jesus Christ because the New Testament makes it clear that Jesus is Israel. Matthew makes it clear. All the New Testament writers make it clear that Jesus is Israel. He called his son out of Egypt, for example. And so what we see here with this lion's den situation in Daniel's life is prophetic prefiguring what is to come with Jesus Christ. And we see that with the death, burial, and resurrection. The stone that sealed Daniel's tomb, which was the lion's den, should give that away, along with the fact that Daniel came up out of the pit alive. And we have another uh, connection here back to Joseph, because remember, Daniel was a new Joseph, and Joseph was thrown in a pit and brought back out. That was Joseph's death, burial, and resurrection. So we have Daniel's death, burial, and resurrection, symbolically, of course. And so this is a story about what Jesus would do to satisfy the unchangeable law of God that prescribed death for anyone who seeks help or worships one beside the true king of all the earth. Now, I believe that Darius' decree here is actually theocentric as well because God issued an unchangeable law back in the garden, right? Apostatize from God's word and you will surely die. And it's not just this detail about the tomb and this new life at dawn. Remember, the resurrection takes place at dawn, just exactly when Daniel's pulled up out of the, out of the uh, tomb. In fact, Jesus is even buried right before nightfall. They were trying to hurry and get the body in the tomb because the next day was Passover. So there's a lot of parallels here going on between Jesus' crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. But in a very real sense, Jesus was thrown into the lion's den throughout his ministry. You see, it was not just Babylon that was associated with lions. You remember last, week, last time how I talked about Babylon and Israel? The destruction on Babylon is described in the same kind of terms as Israel. And you have the stars falling from the sky, the sun being darkened, and the moon turning to blood. You see the same kind of language being used in reference to Israel. Well, this idea of a lion as representing a kingdom is not just a representative of Babylon it's a representation of Judah as well go back to Genesis chapter 49 and so we see here another connection between Daniel and Jesus because not only was Daniel thrown into lion's den when Jesus went to his people to, was born to his brothers the Judeans he was also thrown into a lion's den 
Genesis chapter 49. Notice what Jacob calls Judah in verse 8. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. Another connection between Israel, particularly Judah, and Babylon. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we see how Babylon, the name Babylon, is referring to apostate Israel, apostate Judah. So there's a lot of connections between Babylon and Judah especially. Judah and Babylon are both characterized as lions. But Judah was a den of lions as well. When Jesus came to his own to fulfill God's salvation of his people, he also dealt with lions, just as Daniel had to deal with lions. Consider how many details in Daniel chapter 6 bear a remarkable resemblance to what happened in Christ's ministry. Let's look at the chapter again, thinking about Jesus Christ and his ministry. The very first thing, Daniel quickly distinguished himself from the other officials. Jesus quickly distinguished himself from the other teachers of the law and the Pharisees and the the Sadducees by his wisdom. Those jealous of Daniel sought to find charge against him based on the law of his God. Those jealous of Jesus sought to find charge against him, against Jesus, by questioning him about the law. Right? You can read about that in Matthew chapter 22. Daniel's enemies sought his death by false testimony. Jesus' enemies also sought his death by false testimony. Daniel's enemies appealed to the king with a charge of sedition. That's really what it boiled down to. This man, Daniel, is undermining your kingdom and disobeying your laws. Jesus' enemies appealed to Pilate with a charge of sedition. They told Pilate, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. See how the the principles are the same? King Darius tried to rescue Daniel, but could not. Pilate also tried to release Jesus, but could not. Now, there is a difference there because Pilate was not found at the tomb on resurrection morning, such as Darius. So there's a difference there. Darius was a believer, Pilate was not. The satraps and officials spoke brazenly to King King Darius and demanded the death of Daniel, just like the Jewish leaders stirred up the crowds and demanded Jesus' death. Remember, they stirred up the crowds to say, crucify him, crucify him. The lion's den was sealed by the king with a stone at sunset. Jesus was laid in the tomb just before sundown and Pilate ordered the tomb to be sealed with a stone. Probably the most obvious connection right there. King Darius, a believer, comes to the lion's den at dawn, just like the disciples go to Jesus' tomb early in the morning to find his body gone and Jesus alive. The enemies of Daniel who tried to kill him along with their whole family were destroyed in the end and the enemies of Christ along with their entire families lost their authority and were destroyed in God's judgment at the hands of the Romans in AD 70. Darius praises God's dominion and reign after judgment had fallen. And so we see also the parallel in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 11, that God's people celebrate the full establishment of God's kingdom after judgment fell in AD 70. You can see that in Revelation chapter 11. The kingdom of the world... That would be the kingdom established way back, way back in the Old Testament, has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. And we'll get to the prophecies of Daniel where Daniel foresaw a time when the saints would possess the kingdom. See, right here, what we have is Nebuchadnezzar possessing the kingdom, and then Darius conquers Belshazzar, and then Darius receive the kingdom and then we're going to get to the point in Daniel's prophecies where he foresees a time when the saints would possess the kingdom this is all one big story so consider that Daniel in the lion's den is not just a great story from the book of Daniel Daniel in the lion's den teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ in a most amazing and artistic way remember that the book of Daniel was written nearly 500 years before the coming of Christ God ordained all the details in such a way that those who loved Daniel's God 
would learn to love Jesus Christ when the time came. And we can look at all of these details and have faith that God exists and works in history to accomplish His will. He will protect us as He protected Daniel if we live by the faith of Daniel. So may we learn the full lessons of Daniel 6 that the way into true life is only through death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, You have given us life. You have become a God to us. You have planted us in the land of Your promise, the good land of blessing. We thank You and praise You for what You've done in our history as God's people. We thank You and praise You for what You're doing in our time today. We pray that You'd use us in the tools as tools of your hands, as your children, as strong arrows in your hands. We pray that you'd encourage us, strengthen us through the tasks that we have in our own families and the tasks that we have in this community, that we might be light to the world and and salt a sweet savor. We pray that you'd bless us and guide us in the week to come, keep us safe in our travels and in our work, for we place our trust in you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.